Hello folks, today we are at the Vintage Computer Festival or Federation Festival which is conveniently located at the Computer History Museum. How convenient is that? Multics folks over there. And that's our own setup. So over here we have a Alto card. That's the ALU at the a disc. And some customers. So you can try your hand at the Alto. You have the two altos, uh, the real one and the emulated one here. They are hooked up through the Ethernet here. We have a little thin Ethernet and going to try to play some maze wire. Playing maze wires. And the other main war stations emulated over here. Left, we got I think he got you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, so this is Josh, Hello. by the way, and Josh uh, is from the Living Computer Museum and this, this incredible uh, simulator that we used in the, um, uh, when we were restoring the Alto and we are also showcasing it at the, uh, uh, the festival today. Um, Contralto is a project I started about two years ago uh -huh. uh, just to see if I could do it and it turns out Yes, um, it's a microcode level simulation of the uh, the Alto computer. It, it can emulate an Alto one or an Alto two, um, and at this point, it seems to be able to run any Alto software uh, you can throw at it. Yeah, um, everything we have run runs exactly the same on the emulate on your emulator and, and on on, the, on our machine. Yep, uh, it also supports uh, Ethernet, so you can you can network a couple of, of emulators together or. If you have the right hardware, you can uh, network it with a uh, real Alto. So here we have the Contralto window that you get when you start it up. Uh, you can load a new uh, Alto disk pack into memory by going to the load menu here. And we're going to load in Smalltalk today, so I can show you what Smalltalk 76 looks like. We'll start the system, and we'll switch to full screen to make it easier to see. And we're, here we are at the Alto Executive prompt, which is just a simple operating system with a command line interface. And we are going to, if I can type, We're going to resume the small talk image, which is basically like a kind of a, a memory dump of the uh, small talk world. And so we're going to start that, and this will take a few seconds. And so here we have the uh, small talk interface. It's uh, a graphical interface with overlapping windows. So we're going to bring up the uh, bitrect editor, which is a um, kind of like a little paint program built into Smalltalk. And there we go, we have our little editor running here. And by default it just takes whatever's behind the, uh, the window to use as it's back, as it's, you know, gr the graphics, it kind of captures uh, what's on screen. I'm just going to draw a white block on it to start with so we can, we can uh, see what's being drawn. So it's, it looks a little bit like, uh, like Mac Paint or uh, MS Paint. 
and we can we can draw. There. Awesome. Ta-da. And we have some of the original Xerox Park people here uh, for the talk this afternoon. This is Jeff Thompson and Dan Swinehart. Hey Jeff, can you show your Xerox badge? There you go. Dial in, you have built file servers uh, and uh, the mail and, and uh, the post. He's actually talking, he was talking about how he wrote his own alpha. He did because he got fed up. He was trying to fix it. He was trying to get it. Alright, then we have the master. Dick Lion sign his own mouse. Go for it. I can make this magic. Excellent, hold on, yes. Another exhibit from the LCM, uh, and that is the Multex. So they have recreated a, a full control panel. And here's the Master of the Beast, uh, Charles Anthony, right? And you wrote the emulator? Uh, I'm one of a team that wrote the emulator. So it's running Multex? It is the 6180 or DBS 8M emulator running Multex before your very eyes. So uh, Multex was the predecessor of Unix, right? Uh, Bell Labs was involved in the Unix development project, in the Multics development, and the Kernigan and Ritchie and all those people used Multics and saw a lot of stuff they liked in it, but it only ran on these multi-million dollar mainframes. They wanted something that would run on their uh, lab computers. They took the stuff they liked from Multics and other stuff from other places and made Unix. So, not a code father, but a philosophical father, influ heavily influential in predecessor. the predecessor. An influential predecessor. Hi, Jeff. You get the microphone. You have to explain what you did to make this thing working. Okay, what I did was I made an interface for the lamps and the switches on this panel. Uh, when those, we got this panel, um, all the wires were still here and uh, they were cut off about down here. So what I did was I soldered uh, connectors onto the ends of each of the wires and then I made boards to drive the, uh, the lamps and to read the switches. There are 576 lights. Yeah, that's the slight problem. And uh, this is a basis 3 board with a Xilinx FPGA on it, which takes data off of a serial port, a uh, USB serial port. Our emulator lives in a Nook processor up here. So and that's your supercomputer? That's the supercomputer, and it's uh, sending data at 38k baud down to the panel, which will refresh the lights about 20 times a second. And here are partners in crime, Lyle and Bob Rosenblum. With Lisa and a Tektronix. Tektronix. Uh, 
Hey Bob. Yes. I'm going to hand you the microphone, and your task is to explain your Tektronics. Uh, computer. <laughs> it's a computer? It's a computer. Uh, it's a Tektronix 4052A. It's the second generation of the Tektronix computers. The first was the 4051. The 4051 used the Motorola 6800 microprocessor. It was quite slow. This is using a 16-bit bit slice made out of the AMD 2901s, but it's much faster than the 6800 overall. The screen is 1024 by 780. It's a storage tube display with vector graphics, so it's drawing lines between points. It has apparent, you know, the apparent resolution looks higher even, uh, but there's no refresh. So once you fill up the screen, uh, and it's stored in the tube itself, you have to clear the whole screen. Its main um, use is scientific computing and visualization of you know equations and uh, mathematics because it has a nice graphics output. Drives plotters has a the Tektronix version of IEEE 488, the uh, GPIB bus, an interface to many instruments. Little tape drive, 300 kilobyte uh, DC 300 tape drive right here, which. Uh, is the bane of restoration now because they're driven by little bands that break and this one's broken so it no longer works. Tell me about it. Yes, everyone's been through that. I'm going to dwell on it so then I'll, 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 I'll make it go in fast motion. <laughs> yes, that would be a good idea. So the next one will be, I believe, just a, a set of circles using the ROM cartridge. Okay. Yes, perfect circles. And they're still done out of line segments, but they're using smaller segments than it's built in normally. Next one's another, uh, I believe, uh, hidden line removal thing, but it's a much faster one. So those tick mark generations are built into the basic. It has uh, yeah, like like the HP yeah. D5. It's one statement and yeah. Except this is mighty fast compared to the HP D5. It has to sync for every tick. Yes. Now it'll sit here for another 10 seconds. So the next one will draw circles, and then um, so dot, the grid. yeah, then the grid over the circles, and it uh, here you go. So the line drawing you'll see is much faster. That's it. And it's going to go back to your other one. I'm Dave Babcock. I'm the leader of a volunteer project here at the Computer History Museum. And we've taken an authentic IBM 1620 panel and we've replaced the lights and switches, but it's driven by a cycle accurate simulator. We're right now running a Power of Two demo program. And the, the goal of this project is to recreate the experience of running a real 1620, but using new new processors and we've integrated it with a Raspberry Pi computer and some daughter boards that drive these LEDs realistically so that you can really experience what it was like for a 1960s scientific computer to push the buttons, to type on the typewriter and really run programs like you would if you were back in the 1960s. One of the unique things about the IBM 1620 is this front panel was used for three purposes. It was used to operate the machine with these lights and switches. It was used by programmers using these panels to debug your program. And it was 
used by the field engineers looking at these three panels to diagnose the running of the machine. So as an operator, I could put in a program and I could hit start and I could change the function of the program by toggling these switches. But as a programmer who wanted to debug my program, I could single step my program one instruction at a time, see the op code, see the data, see the addresses, and I could really debug my program and how it was flowing through the machine and what was going on. But as a field engineer, I could single cycle using these panels and I could see the internal gates of the machine and every cycle of the machine and what it does to execute each instruction. So if there was a machine failure, I could find what part of the machine was failing by diagnosing it with that. And that's the consignment area. Some poor looking Max. Alright, so it was interesting and fun. It's an astrological calculator. Sorry, an astrology mini computer. What about this one? Okay, these are test, fire. Vibrator. Cool military panel to launch a rocket of some sort. Just has a little problem with it, it's hundred dollars. That's Salem's corner, so he has all the interesting stuff. Osborne. An HP plotter. Compact luggable. The freedom thing. That's I should get that one. one Talking about weird machine, the HP Integral running some version of HP Unix and with a inkjet printer in it. What a weird animal. And then it it falls like a Dolge computer. So you put it all back together like this. What is it, Josh? It's some kind of dumb terminal. It's made by a company called Informer. I think they went on to make other terminals. This, this, I couldn't find anything about it yet, but I'm going to do a little more research. This is the neatest. I love terminal. This is neat. Yeah. Wow, it was a little pedestal. It has all the, uh, the dip switch settings right, documented on the bottom, which is convenient. I don't even need to find the manual. I can just... <laughs> My name is Lyle Bickley, and this is a Lisa running Lisa OS, which is very different than the Macintosh. Um, it kind of looks like a Macintosh, but functionally it's different than the Macintosh. Um, for, one, for one thing, it's very obvious, I have two files here, and guess what their name is? Both of them are called test. The Lisa operating system is the only operating system that I know of that allows you to have duplicate file names. So that's a uniqueness of the Lisa OS. When you do something, it's very polite. It says, this moment, please, right? So you know that it's working, you know it's doing something, and you just have to wait for it. Uh, I always wish Windows would do that or Macintosh would do that because a lot of times I click something and then I click it again because I don't know whether anything's happened, and then I get two of them. You never do that here. So we usually think of, of saving things and putting them away. We would call that closing the file. Uh, they don't want to use a word like that because people wouldn't know what it meant. But putting it away is understandable. Saving and continue is understandable. But here is set aside. Now, so we set aside it. What does that mean? Well, we get a phone call and we just want to put it aside because maybe somebody's gonna ask us a question about some other file that we're gonna look at. So we just wanna put this one out of the way while we, while we do that. Well, so it moves it to where? The desktop. But it also shows us where it was from so that we know positionally what that belongs to. So that helps. Now we could either double click this and it'll just go back to where it was 
or if it's the end of the day and we want to go home or we're going to lunch or whatever, we just put it back here and then it'll save it. And so then we're back to where we started. So it's, uh, it's brilliant. The other thing that's, I think, I think the most profound thing about the Lisa OS is let's suppose we're all finished now doing everything we want to do and it's the end of the day, right? What do you want to do? You want to turn your computer off. Well, you go up here, you, and for us, who are used to Windows or Mac, there's nothing that says turn the computer off. Why? Because that's not how a person would really think about a computer. What do you do? You go over and you turn it off. You push the button that says turn it off. Okay, so what does it say? It says Lisa's putting everything away before turning off. It's clean up for you. And notice how it does it. It picks them all up, it moves them back, puts them back where they ought to be. So it takes it a while. It saves the state of everything, as we would call it, saving state. And then it nicely dims the screen and turns off. Right? Now, we come back in the next morning, we turn it on. So the feature that we're about to watch didn't happen on Macintoshes or Windows for 10 years after this. Well, here it is, it's, it's coming up. Now you notice it puts everything back exactly where it was, remembers the state of the machine, and if we click on the clock, again it says just a moment, you can tell it's still thinking, right? And it puts the time and date the way it was. So. So there's Elisa too. Thanks for bringing it. You're welcome. So in the mini and mainframe category, wow. in third place, we have Baltics W1. back to Eric's booth because I didn't film him because I had him last year but he's won first place so I need to pay a visit and it's still awesome. Wait you have two awards? You're, you're twice very good. This is the original 6502 original 6502 and this is the monster 6502 Always individual transistors. And another VCF in the books, and we got a second place award and a poster signed by everybody that was on the Xerox Park alumni panel. And smartly Dick Lyon signed next to his mouse. But we knew better, and we had a white pen, and we had him sign his own mouse, so we have a Dick Lion mouse signed by Dick Lion, so all in all, I thought that was a good VCF. Alright, see you next time. <laughs>